Good morning. My name is Jason Pick. I'll be presenting today for Landscape Alberta on turf grass adaptation, weed control, and pesticides. The basis of this objective talk today is to determine and possibly come up with some solutions to why we generally move from a mono stand on the left hand side to the right hand side where you have a mixed bag of multiple different species and various levels uh, of their evolution. Obviously an aesthetic challenge for uh, most of us. It also offers uh, some playability challenges that we as turf grass managers have to overcome. Despite having uh, very specific blends for very specific uses, uh, we still find ourselves in uh, trouble having failures in uh, turf stands all over the place, whether it's golf courses, sports field, parks and otherwise. What's happening? Failure and encroachment typically occurs in uh, traffic areas, uh, both golf courses, sports field, parks. Um, in the examples that you see here, we've got a fairway on the left-hand side where uh, has, which began as Kentucky bluegrass uh, and ryegrass has slowly uh, felt the encroachment of annual bluegrass. And similarly on the right-hand side, species uh, have crept in to that Kentucky bluegrass stand. Obviously a lot more annual bluegrass in the right-hand side. And the unfortunate um, resodding that took place on that field on the right, um, which uh, leaves kind of a, an aesthetic stain on the map, so to speak, um, not really uh, ideal for uh, those very common repairs that we've got to do. So we've got to try to come up with uh, some ideas and understand why that encroachment uh, happens at such a dramatic uh, effect. Now, some of the obvious problems with surface inconsistency is not just aesthetic. Uh, in the image here on the right, you can see annual bluegrass uh, having been opportunistic and taking over a Kentucky bluegrass rough um, that was lost to winter kill. Um, it's produced now, in this situation, inconsistent service. A poor ball roll, bad lies, unsafe footing, uh, and has a variable time to recover. Also reacts a little bit differently to how we treat it. Having two different species with two different management regimes creates some difficulty for uh, turf managers out there. So we're trying to uh, avoid some of the higher costs of repair and maintenance with uh, some of these encroaching grasses. If you haven't been aware uh, already, the National Turf Grass Evaluation Program provides an exhaustive list of species and varieties which uh, are best suited for your specific situation. Uh, it's not just the latest and the greatest. Uh, some of you will have uh, areas on your property that are shaded, requiring a shade species. Others, um, full sun, requiring a, a full sun species. And every which way in between in terms of color, drought tolerance, you name it, we have a, a variety for it. So that being said, not all grasses are um, considered equal. Look on the NTEP site, first of all, uh, to make sure that you uh, give that sports field or park or playing area the best chance at survival by picking the right grass off the top. In this section we're going to talk a little bit about turf grass adaptation. You know when we start these fields up with perfect mono stands, whether it's sodded or seeded, we have one specific variety or two varieties that are well suited for each other. They blend in well, aesthetically very pleasing, and uh, are going to work the way we want them to work. Uh, some things happen which cause that encroachment by uh, off species. So we'll try to uh, discuss why that happens and maybe a few different ways to counteract it. Now first things first, plants can, or most grasses, can reproduce either asexually or sexually. That is to say, uh, through mitosis, they can reproduce, reproduce identical offspring uh, without a partner. And meiosis, which is sexual reproduction, requires homologous pairing partners uh, to, in order to produce fertile offspring. So either way, species can, uh, can uh, propagate a number of different ways. In mitosis, that's where a haploid cell divides and produces genetically identical replicas of one another. Meiosis, on the other hand, is the sexual reproduction work, which requires a combination of those haploid cells um, of that parental chromosome resulting in a diploid cell. Essentially why uh, meiosis is how humans propagate and why we have our offspring are uh, hopefully the best of both uh, parents. Now 
I would typically ask in a live environment is uh, this an example of mitosis or meiosis and um, I'm getting about the same reaction from the virtual field as I would live um, never a great joke teller but nonetheless uh, mitosis this might be an example of genetically identical offspring or uh, what annual bluegrass might produce now genotype is another type of evolution in that the same species, the same variety where it begins, evolves over time. It's not an encroachment of different species necessarily, but a different variety. Uh, in this case, you'll see the uh, upper picture, that's Pebble Beach, um, is a transition, transition from the uh, bent grass monostand into a polystand of bent grass. Gene expression has produced multiple different biotypes on that same putting surface. And you can see it, it looks a little bit sick. It looks a little, uh, you know, like we've made some kind of error or disease of some sort, but it, it isn't. This is just turf grass expressing itself uh, at different stages of evolution, some being darker, some being uh, tighter, more dense than others, uh, some, some simply evolving faster than, uh, than others. Now, phenotype is also an adaptation of grasses that can cause variations on the playing surface. These are site-specific. Um, they motivate the expression of genes based on the environment they're in, whether it's shade or um, soil-based, if it's sandy or super dry or, um, or sodic. The uh, plant will evolve to accommodate and grow and express those genes within its gene pool um, in order to survive. And that's called um, phenotype. Now, phenotype plasticity is the ability of that plant to uh, survive and adapt. Some plants are, have a very um, narrow uh, plasticity where others have a great strength, such as annual bluegrass being one of those with great plasticity. It allows um, gene expression in that species to take on the best attributes of its respective parent. Bluegrasses are, and bent grasses are generally limited by comparison to annual bluegrass, that's why we see bluegrass being so diverse and we find it everywhere. This is an example, thanks to uh, Jim Ross of uh, Prairie Turf Research Center, who uh, discovered this grass uh, growing on roadside, expressing uh, exactly a genotype and a phenotype uh, elasticity, or what we refer to when they're both combined is epigenetics. So you can see this grass growing on a right beside a road, very harsh environment, uh, practically straight pea stone gravel, very uh, low nutrient, but and it's the same species that's been seeded into that hillside, uh, yet it's thriving. Uh, an example of, uh, of uh, great plasticity. So in this uh, case here, we see uh, uh, a unique environment. Now, you know, you'd think that, oh, this is a great grass, this is exactly what we want, let's transplant it, move it to where uh, we need it. Well, the fact is, this specific species and variety has adapted to survive in this environment, but as soon as you change it, it becomes uh, a race as to how fast can it revert back or adapt to this new climate. In uh, most efforts, most attempts to uh, move these things around uh, are generally unsuccessful, or they don't express themselves the same way they did in that environment where they were collected. Uh, another uh, important piece that we've got to recognize here is called resource allocation. Every, uh, every species has um, an affinity to allocate resources based on where it needs it. Now this is an example of uh, the image here is the hydroponic plant. It's been fed um, nutrient filled water, it's flowing over cross of the root zone uh, routinely and you can see obviously a much uh, rather large plant working in a very small a pot or a very limited root zone. So what's happening here is resource allocation. The plant has uh, all the nutrients, all the light that it needs, it has all the best of every growing environment needing nothing to draw or needing to draw nothing from the soil, uh, essentially being fed hydroponically. It doesn't have to look for uh, nutrients in the soil. So it allocates its resources. You know, if, um, if I have all the water I need on a single root growing below me and I have uh, artificial stability 
I have all the light I need. I have all the water I need washing across that single tap root or otherwise fibrous root um, system, then I'm not going to uh, spend any energy growing a massive root system if I don't need to. In this case, it's looking to bud, making uh, uh, use of all those resources that it's already been uh, provided, so it doesn't have to search for any. So it's a way of, of um, kind of directing the energy that you put into it to where it needs it the most and not wasting it where uh, it doesn't need it. Um, now, each generation of species that goes through this adaptation has uh, an opportunity to adapt and improve. Um, this is referred to as uh, adaptation fitness. Now, that in an example here, and this is a, uh, an image of uh, the repeated mowing that we do on our playing surfaces, low or high, whether it's uh, an eighth of an inch or half an inch, the repeated mowing of turf grass is an injury. It's a, it's a threat to that turf grass species. So it, what we call a selection force. Now that species, in this case it's a golf green, um, that turf grass doesn't want to get cut off. It wants to grow taller and taller and taller, but yet we injure it every single day. So it's, it's a, a threat. So the species, in this case, is adapting to that threat by um, adjusting its uh, evolution to avoid growing taller, which we, of course, just go out every day and cut it off. So in this case, um, fitness, referring to top growth and the adaptation of this grass, uh, allocating its resources instead of top growth, instead of gibberellin, which, which inhibit, or, uh, creates top growth, um, it will redirect all that energy into spreading or root growth um, in order to survive, which is essentially the the uh, plan for all these grasses. So we'll ask each other, why is annual bluegrass so competitive? Well, annual bluegrass is very, very unique. And uh, I get a little bit fired up when I talk about um, annual bluegrass because it is an evolutionary um, hero. Uh, Charles Darwin had a comment back in 1809, it's not the strongest that, of a species that survive, um, nor the most intelligent, but the one most responsive to change, essentially adaptation. And this is where annual bluegrass gets its great strength and why we find it encroaching into our um, playing surfaces. So we'll talk a little bit right now about um, why it has such a competitive advantages, advantage despite all of our efforts to produce you know, superior species through breeding and genetics um, at, uh, at NTEP and uh, through all of our research. So annual bluegrass has uh, for many years been unknown as to where it came from. Um, but advances in DNA mapped it, found out that Poa subpoena and Poa infirma were the two parents of this Poa annual, which, which we find all over the world now. Poa infirma is an annual species. So you can see the, the, um, the seed head on that uh, blade of infirma there. Early meadow grass. It's found in Mediterranean regions of South Europe. Uh, has a bunch type growth growth habit. It's a true annual, just like annual bluegrass um, in its most primal stage. It it uh, dies after seeding. Its whole life is to propagate, to produce seed. So it ends spending up all its energy to roost this seed. Once it's seed, it dies, propagating the next um, evolution or the next generation, theoretically, or hopefully more fit in its opinion. But in the meantime, filling the seed bank with its offspring in order to continue to survive. So Poa and Firma had no use as a turf, had no tolerance to uh, mowing, but as you can recall, or you may um, uh, see on your facilities, is it's still, Poa annual still maintains a lot of these um, uh, attributes that came from its first parent. Now Poa subpoena, many of you in sports fields are uh, probably familiar with. It's a true perennial, it's stoloniferous, meaning it grows not in bunch, but spreads out and across through stolons, grows in mountainous regions of Central Europe, and already used extensively for on athletic fields and golf course fairways. Now, the, uh, to, to continue the conversation, how do two species, you've got an annual and a perennial annual uh, a bluegrass plant combining, but they're quite different. Um, 
the fact that it's an annual or perennial would suggest that there's a genetic barrier there that uh, wouldn't normally be crossed. Uh, now the image is, a, is showing is uh, a bit of an example of that, but really um, the, the difference in the poa annuals, parents, plants, are they're very, very different. One's annual, one's perennial, one's low growing, one's intolerant to mowing. Um, they're exceedingly different and very, very unusual for two diverse species like that um, to connect, to produce fertile offspring. Now we've tried to do this before. Uh, when, uh, and you might, if those of you that are uh, um, ranchers out here or have been or know some, know that when parents are too diverse to combine, they produce uh, infertile uh, offspring. And that's the uh, combination of a horse and a donkey producing a mule. The chromosomes don't line up. A horse of 64 and a donkey of 62 uh, produces offspring, but again, they can't propagate. So that's an example of um, a, a non-homogalous pairing where chromosomes uh, of the two parents are not um, compatible. And we've done this already. Uh, we've produced through breeding um, hybrids, non-homogalous pairing partners. Uh, a great example is uh, the Bermuda grasses that we grow on um, uh, sports fields and uh, golf courses down in the south. Uh, some of those high-end tiff eagles uh, and tiff green varieties, or tiff eagle rather, um, is infertile. We've uh, bred it to, to uh, express certain attributes that we want, uh, but those uh, at the cost or cost that uh, they don't produce seed anymore. They propagate only vegetatively. So this image here on the left hand side and, and the right, you can see they are, they've aggressively verticutted or, or um, um, dethatched all the propagative points in that uh, stoloniferous uh, Bermuda grass and they're uh, physically moving it to another location packing it up or selling it as a vegetative uh, living um, transplant. Now we I chatted earlier a little bit about haploid being a single individual the the, the um, uh, genetic duplication of that same species where diploid is two homogalous sets of chromosomes that are compatible. Um, polyploid cells are multiple sets of chromosomes now, they do result in uh, genome duplication without cell division, where you have uh, a 2 plus 2 diploid cell uh, to produce a polyploid offspring. And uh, it can occur in nature, but it's exceedingly rare. And uh, I'll use the example here of Jurassic Park. You know, they produced a sterile offspring by combining the genes of uh, multiple different species of dinosaurs in, this, in the movie, but it's, it's kind of talking about the same thing. Um, what our scientists thought could never happen, or their scientists thought could never happen, and what shouldn't happen is that donkey producing fertile offspring. Um, as they say, nature has a way of writing itself. That's exactly what happened in Jurassic Park, and is exactly what happened with annual bluegrass. What happened with annual bluegrass is it was an infertile offspring producing uh, their incompatible number of chromosomes. What ended up happening was instead of um, being able to reproduce uh, fertile offspring, it produced that infertile chromosome uh, or that inf infertile cell, which instead of um, just dying off, um, produced, produced its own pairing partner. When it, when it went to... Um, reproduce, not being able to line up wasn't a, an option for it and exceedingly rare in nature. What it did is it duplicated all of its chromosomes from 14 to 28 and now annual bluegrass um, became its own pairing partner or homologous pairing partner, therefore restore, restoring uh, meiosis and mitosis. So this is an example of the genetic uh, makeup of your annual bluegrass uh, plant. Poa annua, you can see on uh, the left-hand side, produces, um, there's, there's the poa annua plant. That's, the, that's the, uh, uh, the offspring. This is inferma, excuse me, and this is um, supina. The combination of the two, instead of taking the best of both parents, which didn't um, match up, simply duplicated both, therefore creating a pairing partner of its own. Now we can do this in real life by manufacturing 
uh, polyploids. It actually comes from the cold gene, the cro crocus plant. Um, what we can do is we can deny splitting of chromosomes when it hits interface and uh, duplicate the sheer volume of, of uh, genetic material in each cell. And this is what happens when we have um, when we produce these massive uh, fruits uh, and, and vegetables. The uh, fundamental issue about uh, denying duplication of or, or creating duplication of chromosomes in the cell is physically larger. It takes up more space, therefore we have produced larger plants. Now in, in our business, at least in the golf business that is, um, we're trying to mow grasses at an eighth of an inch and in many cases below um, doubling the genetic um, material in each cell, which would produce a larger plant, goes against our primary objective here with, to produce shorter, tighter, faster uh, golf greens or turf grass plants. So that's why we got into the problem with our, our Bermuda grass species where you have to trade off one for another. We can't have big plants, but we want certain varieties. Um, that's a limitation, something we have to be aware of. Now the polyploid advantage, as I mentioned before, is elasticity. Species that um, change in time depending on where they happen to be growing uh, based on um, genotype, phenotype. Um, annual bluegrass has this great elasticity in that it's got double the chromosomes of both of, of, its, of its parents. So that is all of its mother's chromosomes, all of its father's chromosomes, and has an affinity to draw upon those um, at any given moment. Uh, I, I shouldn't say every given moment, but in, in genetically speaking, uh, when we see gene expression in a species uh, among its parents in as quick as 10 years um, is kind of a, an incredible evolutionary advancement. That is to say that um, annual bluegrass can draw on its annual seeding um, traits of its parent, or um, if we're cutting off those seed heads every day, um, it will revert within 10 years to its perennial counterpart and, not and start not producing seed and uh, changing into a perennial type. So it's kind of an, an amazing plant that way. Uh, and because of this wide range of, uh, of area that we found it, that's why it has this ability to thrive both in warm environments or cool environments. So the evolution here, you can see this is a Pebble Beach, 2010 US Open. Um, there was more than 50 different biotypes of annual bluegrass in that uh, putting green. Um, and annual bluegrass begins to take on, under these circumstances anyways, take on uh, the perennial attributes in as little as 10 years. So the next question is, how do we promote it? Or do we eradicate it? Is it a losing battle? And where do we go from here? Well, we know that um, greens type, is a perennial has perennial strengths favored by less disruption so it produces more seed a little to, to no seed i should say it's more tolerant of environmental stress it's more adapted to closer mowing uh, has a higher shoot density and as i mentioned involves in as little as 10 years from annual types or why i call, often call primal types into these perennial low growing types now the rough type this is this is the uh the variety that is favored by surface disruption. And how this reflects is every time um, we have take out a divot or every time the football field, a football team takes to the field and tears up the center lines, uh, we're disrupting the surface, giving the opportunity of that rough type um, annual variety to see the sky, to uh, get through the surface and begin to germinate. So with every time we disrupt the surface, some, some would argue unavoidable, uh, we create this opportunity for these um, primal annual varieties to uh, take over. They're uh, extremely sensitive to heat, uh, cold, drought. Uh, they have a low shoot density, coarse texture, um, and as you know, produces all of its energy, all of its energy it produces every year goes towards seed head production, which uh, during the seed bl blooms in the spring and the fall can produce that white haze of white seed uh, all over the playing surface which is uh, not always what we're looking for. Now, annual bluegrass as a winter annual, which is its true term, in fact, um, we have a seed surge in the spring and in the fall. 
The uh, most annual varieties, as you know, spends all of its energy to seed. So when you see um, midsummer, that annual bluegrass coming back up, that's the second generation of that primal variety. However, we also have both different types of annual bluegrass in most sands, stands. If you have playing surface that's 10 years uh, or older, it's very likely you have seen this adaptation. So that seed surge of, um, that you see in the spring is producing new offspring, but you also have uh, perennial types beginning to emerge that you're managing as well. So it makes it very difficult to try to differentiate one uh, to the other. Now, big question is, if annual bluegrass has such a superior adaptation, why does it still have such poor coral temperature tolerance? And uh, normally I would pose this to the um, class and ask your opinions here, but the fact is evolution requires um, uh, selection forces. You recall what I mentioned about the uh, mowing. Um, something that continually stresses that turf to force it to change. And uh, the reason why annual bluegrass hasn't been able to adapt to cold temperature or winter kill is uh, winter or that drop in temperature hasn't given it the opportunity to uh, to adapt. It doesn't have enough time. If it was if it was, it can't really die a little bit. So that's the challenge in, um, in Poa's lack of adaptation to uh, winter tolerance. Minimizing annual bluegrass competition. As we've talked about before, annual bluegrass does have a competitive advantage against bluegrass uh, due to the diversity and, and adaptability of its plants. We've tried a number of things to try to remove it from our playing surface or minimize competition. Uh, one of those uh, efforts was to mow it out. We, we thought reducing the height of cut would take it out of its comfort zone and eventually we would be able to mow it out by height. Um, however, it's proven to be too, quite adaptable to that and due to those um, selection forces has actually reduced its um, top growth to avoid um, the effects of mowing. Uh, so obviously that didn't really work for mowing annual bluegrass now after the intervention below. Um, so my uh, advice here to dispel this myth is when you're choosing turf grasses for your specific application, whether it's for the park or golf stream, uh, it has an optimum height of cut in bred into that species. That optimum height of cut should be maintained. The further you get outside of that optimum, uh, the more likely it is you'll have weed encroachment, uh, whether it's annual bluegrass or other broadleaf weeds. The second myth that we'll dispel today is um, phosphorus. Now, because of the seeding um, um, habit of the annual bluegrass types and our uh, opinion of how, uh, or our knowledge of how to establish a uh, new seed with phosphorus, thought well we could deny phosphorus uh, applications and therefore deny the ability of annual bluegrass to, um, to germinate. And uh, unfortunately what ended up happening here is we denied that macronutrient not just from the annual bluegrass but also from the turf around it. So what ended, what ended up happening was annual bluegrass began to adapt you know, faster than other varieties are able to and uh, took on an affinity for phosphorus sequestration between uh, four and six inches to a point much better than that of its neighbor, the Kentucky bluegrass or, or otherwise. So when we began to uh, reduce our phosphorus applications, a critical macronutrient required of all plants, um, we began to give uh, annual bluegrass an even greater advantage. So in that regard, uh, you cannot starve out your annual bluegrass by limiting phosphorus. What you'll end up doing is giving it a uh, uh, don't, um, don't stop putting down those macros. Nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, they're the building blocks. Uh, another myth was that we were going to be able to keep uh, annual bluegrass out of our playing surfaces by using growth rate. Now, although the research has shown that at higher heights, uh, uh, half an inch, uh, we're seeing a slight reduction of um, annual bluegrass in uh, some of our playing surfaces and the, the uh, PGRs of 
same element is the only uh, available uh, growth regulator uh, available to us here in Canada right now, anyway. Um, so on, on uh, longer cut fairways and uh, playing surfaces, give or take three quarters to half an inch, uh, we're seeing gradual reduction in the grass, and I believe that's uh, due to the competitive advantage of those grasses that we uh, seeded or sodded into these playing surfaces when we're within that optimum. So we're giving them that greater uh, advantage. Um, what we did find is uh, annual bluegrass uh, or golf greens that were sprayed with uh, Primo or Primo Max, the uh, Gibberella, which is top growth, um, has proven to, to increase the likelihood of annual bluegrass in our greens. So um, despite our initial impressions, what we thought it would do, again, um, Incidentally, growth regulators, uh, in terms of annual bluegrass, don't really, um, or Primo rather, can't stop cell division. So, what's going to happen is annual bluegrass will adapt to your morning rain, will adapt to everything going uh, on around it. And uh, what we're not, what we're not doing, we may be able to stop it from growing um, higher. That's the gibberellum that is, that is Primo. We're not going to be able to stop it from seeding. And, seeding is how it propagates so until we can uh, uh, acquire some of these american products like trim it uh, capital b trigel or putrigal um, we're not going to be able to stop it from seeding using growth regulators so fyi sorry that's just another myth that's been debunked so our strategy is moving forward here um, we want to try to keep those primal varieties out of the curriculum so um, first things first we want to minimize service destruction Weed seeds we know dominate the soil bank, so we want to reduce or eliminate every opportunity for that um, seed, that annual bluegrass seed, to see the sky and come to life. So by using less destructive tools, like on the right hand side you see the deep down aerator, soil reliever, very similar, um, we can relieve compaction without pulling up a whole lot of the soil to the surface, uh, and that's kind of an advantage to uh, usage and utilization of our fields too. Um, you can't really effectively uh, drag in those quarters and then pull one of the fields up. Uh, these weren't very good weeds in this, especially if the weather came out wet. Um, so these solid kind solutions are much better and as, as it's proven um, to minimize or um, reduce annual bluegrass as you uh, enter into your now, I'd also like to uh, propose we rethink some dispensaries. Now, for many years, uh, we have always been told um, that deep and infrequent watering is always the uh, way to go. In fact, that's, uh, that's another uh, way we can rethink summer stress. You know, when we go out there hand watering, uh, we're giving, that's exactly what annual bluegrass wants. It has a shallow root system. So every time we uh, water before we hit wilt, Every time we go out there in the middle of the day and hit those hot spots, um, we're giving annual bluegrass that competitive advantage. When uh, seeds are in the uh, annual bluegrass seeds are in that upper four to six inches of uh, of the soil, they're waiting to germinate. We're giving a little bit of water frequently, it gives them that uh, greater opportunity to germinate and sprout. So uh, I would ask that you guys practice tough love, minimize the, the uh, amount of um, light and frequent watering and replace it with deep and infrequent watering to minimize the likelihood of any bluegrass uh, germination. Uh, I'd like you to try overseeding with aggressive species. Um, there's some pretty aggressive species in the golf industry that we're using right now, the A's, uh, the G's, and even the uh, T1 species. They grow very, very aggressively uh, and they can uh, effectively choke out any bluegrass. However, that being said, they require a much greater um, management of shade. You know, they grow aggressively, so there's a payback to that. Um, the, uh, from a golf course standpoint, the Oval 10 Cross varieties were excellent. You know, they, um, although they weren't overly competitive with annual bluegrass, they didn't grow particularly aggressively either, so we worked very heavily in that process to make sure we can manage that something for uh, you to consider when we're choosing a more aggressive species to outcompete these um, 
meat teeth and uh, so on, can also consider uh, the potential for increasing your maintenance um, requirements as well. Uh, more frequent birth settings that we can bring about. Um, the next strategy I would suggest is uh, minimize the opportunity for annual bluegrass to um, to grow, essentially germinate. Moving those, those goal moats, moats, try to minimize surface disruption uh, at all costs. Some great uh, advancements here in movable goal posts, which are absolutely fantastic in terms of minimizing centerline uh, damage and trying to spread out the, um, uh, give it a little bit more time for that field to uh, recover uh, and thereby limiting the number of opportunities annual bluegrass can to germinate. Now a rather bold strategy um, for golf course guys, um, annual bluegrass has a very, as I mentioned earlier, has a really high suscepti uh, susceptibility to anoxia or um, survivability und or under anoxic conditions um, below ice. That is to say when, when the plant isn't actively growing, when it can't see the sky and the sun, it's not photosynthesizing. So what it's doing is it's utilizing all of its reserves, all of its energy uh, to get through that period of darkness. Um, in the case of ice, when you have snow cover and ice below it, the plant's under uh, uh, darkness and it, can, it no longer has an opportunity to respire. It still needs, it's burning energy under there and that those gases need to escape. And essentially what, what ice does is it seals up the surface. Now, annual bluegrass can't survive any longer than about 75 days uh, under anoxic conditions, that is, without being able to respire. Now, Kentucky bluegrass, for our golf course guys out there, um, has an ability to survive over 120 days. So for some of the uh, superintendents out there in the room that are um, uh, trying to gamble with this one, annual bluegrass, uh, if, if you have ice on your playing surfaces, uh, and leave the ice on there anywhere between 75 and about 110, 120 days, uh, it's very likely that all that annual bluegrass will die and you'll be left with your preferred species. Now, I wouldn't suggest uh, this route for the um, brand new manager, maybe a little bit more seasoned um, turf managers might go this route, but uh, again, it can be a little bit risky because you never really know what could happen in that uh, very narrow window. So as a general um, surface purity uh, strategic summary, how to keep those uh, weed seeds out of your playing surfaces and keep those uh, fields pure, try to balance N and K, that's nitrogen and potassium, don't skip the phosphorus. Use slow release nitrogens and controlled release nitrogens, that's SRN and CRN, foliars for periods of stress. Fall fertilize. Um, the ability of our plant to get through the winter time is, a, is important. So we pack carbohydrates in the fall. And we'll talk about that in the upcoming uh, session. Uh, consider looking at the National Turf Grass Evaluation Program for the most preferred species in your specific climate, environment, and utilization uh, regime. Uh, minimize disruption. Try to try uh, not to pull a core anymore. Don't give the opportunity for annual bluegrass to see the sky and uh, pulling uh, or, or rather decompacting with solid time tools, uh, whether they're slicing or um, soil reliever type, uh, can be much more preferred and, and better for utilization. We don't take, have to take it out of uh, commission for a week or two. Um, PGRs can be fantastic for reducing your labor and on higher cut turfs, fairways um, can be effective in, in reducing or slowing down um, the advancement of annual bluegrass into your playing surfaces. And we all keep our fingers crossed that we'll have a uh, um, meiosis, mitosis inhibitor uh, come across the border here soon. Specifically, Trimit is already available. Hopefully we can get that going uh, soon. Um, movable posts and traffic management is always gonna be an issue for us. So uh, consider that in your maintenance, maintenance programs. And uh, herbicides, if your municipality will allow both pre and post as uh, potential solutions to surface purity. In this section, I'm gonna talk a little bit about weed control and herbicides. Uh, one of the big topics these days, of course, is the municipal ban on herbicides and how do we keep uh, on top of all our weed problems. There's a, a bunch of different uh, 
uh, options out there that we've been trying. Uh, in my view, none have been particularly successful, maybe help a little. But uh, I wanted to talk a little bit today about understanding where we're at and why. Uh, I hope it helps, and I hope uh, by the time we're done, you'll leave with a different perspective on herbicide use. Now, as you're aware, uh, chemical controls in terms of herbicides fall into four different categories. Uh, they control pre-emergent or post-emergent weeds, grassy, broadleaf, uh, either selectively or non-selectively, all falling into that big heading of herbicides. Now, pre-emergents, those are applied uh, before the weeds come up. They essentially put a film on the surface where emerging plants who hit that film um, die upon emergence. So um, it's certainly not the end of the world if you happen to apply something and decide you need to grow it in um, or have applied it at a, a wrong location anyway. Um, any scarification of the surface, anything that you do to brush up that, um, that top layer uh, breaks up that film and then you can grow tip normally on it. Uh, one of the more uh, common pre-emergence that's available to us here is Betazan 4.8 and there's a link there if you're uh, in need. Now the post-emergent options, of, as I mentioned, are both selective or non-selective. A selective herbicide means you can uh, target a specific broadleaf weed to control or multiple broadleaf weeds in a turf grass stand and it won't hurt the turf. Well, you might see a little bit of phytotoxicity, that's a little bit of yellowing. You can usually counteract that by putting a little bit of iron in the tank. A non-selective treatment is, of course, glyphosate. Uh, most of you will be aware of that as it's commercial and domestically available. And that uh, being non-selective, it'll kill anything, uh, any greenery. So uh, that's the difference, selective and non-selective. Now there are post-emergence um, selectives, or one, I should say, available here um, for annual bluegrass, and that's called Velocity. Uh, some recent studies uh, there at the research link below at Olds College in terms of uh, rates and frequency. Uh, it can be safely applied uh, to control annual bluegrass in your bent, your rye, or your Kentucky bluegrass in order to maintain that um, consistency in the playing surface and uh, kind of combat uh, encroachment. Now, Velocity does uh, require uh, some special care. It does have uh, an, uh, a potential for uh, phytotoxicity, which is what happened here. The um, when you're applying it, they ask that you apply it in the middle of the summer when it's hot, when the plant is actively growing in order for it to be uh, most effective. Uh, however, you got to be careful that you don't have any other stresses going on at the same time. Uh, make sure if you're uh, on a golf course or finely manicured turf that you've got a control fungicide down there. Uh, just in case you don't have two things happening at once would be a good practice in my view to uh, minimize any damage, aside from, of course, all the poa that you're killing. This is an example of some phytotoxicity caused by uh, velocity application of that sodium salt. Again, something to watch for um, if you're uh, treating it to your fields. Now, another treatment that you guys are familiar with is iron sulfate. This is non-selective. Essentially what iron sulfate's doing to your broadleaf plants is you're overloading it with iron and killing it. Uh, it's not selective. If you uh, really look closely, you'll uh, tend to find a little potentially find a little bit of dead grass around it. Now the reason behind that is your broadleaf weed has more surface area. So therefore it has more real estate for that iron sulfate or um, product post, um, to, to stick to essentially. Because turf grass plant is long and thin, it doesn't have a, a great opportunity for the chemical to sit on it. And that's why we're able to um, spray uh, selective controls that uh, will kill broadleafs in uh, grassy environments. If grass were just as wide as the broadleaf, it'd kill it too. Now mowing for weeds is another uh, option that some municipalities are trying uh, or having to go through to try to keep uh, their weed uh, issue down. Unfortunately, as we all know, very expensive, um, labor intensive. Timing is very, very critical. Um, which is also kind of a moving target uh, depending on the season, anything could happen from week to week. So flowering can be quite unpredictable. In, uh, in my opinion, it's a, a make-do, not really a solution uh, to controlling weeds. Uh, but it, like I said, it's the best we, we have at this point. Now, when I say it's the best we have, I want to talk a little bit about 
why it's the best we have. In this last segment, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, pesticides, the precautionary principle, and how it's affecting our municipalities and uh, residences in terms of um, not being able to use the tools that are out there uh, based on uh, regional regulations. Now, to wrap our heads around how this all started, Health Canada registers and certifies uh, products for controlling weeds. Uh, it begins at Health Canada, then it follows down the line to provincial where um, provincial EPEA can make further restrictions and then at the municipal level we can make even more restrictions. Um, so ultimately each municipality can enforce their own rules um, but never making them less restrictive only increasingly strict, uh, stringent. So where this all began the the pesticide ban and why we're at where we're at is in 2001 uh, Hudson Quebec um, imposed legislation, Bill 88, uh, the landmark, as a result of the landmark ruling, Spray Tech versus Hudson. Now, how this came to be was, um, back in the late 80s, we had a dermatologist uh, in Hudson, Quebec, who joined town council. And um, as a dermatologist, she um, suggested or implied that a lot of her patients were suffering because of uh, their skin problems were a result of pesticide use. And due to her position on the board, she was able to uh, push through or propose this uh, ban against pesticide and used a young nine-year-old boy with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma as uh, one of the victims of, of uh, her claims. Now, um, without significant data, um, there was a landmark ruling there in 2001 in Quebec stating the precautionary principle. And that was that the idea of, in the face of scientific uncertainty, it was reasonable to err on the side of caution to protect human health and the environment. Now, since then, we've had seven provinces ban seven province provinces ban uh, cosmetic pesticides. It was driven primarily by uh, homeowners, residents in the community, and public opinion, and uh, with the premise of protecting our children, which is a very noble um, objective and one we should we all I think certainly would agree with. Um, now, what wasn't taken into account. Um, in, in my view here was that each registration, pesticide registration, costs millions of dollars and almost a decade to complete. So it provides some reasonable certainty that products are safe uh, when used according to label directions. Uh, Health Canada requires 200 different types of scientific study, ensures no negative effects to people, animals, birds, insects, plants, or soil or water were, are affected. Now the question that, uh, that um, of course we pose after that is, um, we imposed all these regulations and restrictions, our municipalities did, because they were toxic to children. Um, so I'm put, I put up a little slide here to show um, the relative toxicity of some of the uh, average stuff that we use every single day and compared it to uh, pesticides. Now you can see at the uh, very bottom there, the least um, toxic products, chlorothalonil, uh, second from the least toxic, which has actually uh, been restricted um, to just three applications a year now for um, most commercial entities. And uh, right nearby is Roundup, still domestically available, slightly more toxic, um, but again, a lethal dosage of over 5,000 milligrams per kilogram. And as we go up the, uh, the list there, you can see table salt uh, right about midway, uh, followed by Advil, aspirin caffeine, and vitamin D being uh, one of the most toxic out there. So um, in comparison, you have to t take everything with a grain of salt um, and consider uh, the relative toxicity of all these different products and are we being a little bit too cautious. Now, one of the uh, other things that was that I read from Dr. Melissa Finucane was quite interesting to me. She uh, was uh, a behavioral scientist, or is, and has um, an interesting opinion about misunderstandings about risk, how they complicate our ability to make informed decisions. Uh, as a whole, she, she implies that we're terribly in, uh, terrible at assessing the own uh, risk in our lives. So she has a statement here that, that says, effect heuristic, the dangers produced when we worry more than the evidence says we need to, or less than the evidence says we should. And I think this is exactly what happened when it comes to uh, the fear of pesticide use. 
to just drive a point home, caffeine at uh, 192 milligrams per kilogram is one of the more um, potent or more toxic products out there, but we tend to take it every single day compared to 2,4-D at more than just about 10 times uh, less toxic, followed by our fungicides that are even more so uh, less toxic. Now, here's we'll get on into the, re the, the seriousness of um, what happened in terms of poisonings and perceptions uh, due to a lack of uh, information. Now, when this all came to light following the 2001 ruling, of course, it began to take a hold. And um, so subsequently, uh, the Suzuki Foundation hired David Boyd, an environmental lawyer, to do a survey of pesticide poisonings. And um, it sent our industry in a bit of a tailspin, um, trying to come to terms with um, the perceived dangers of pesticides. Um, now, as you notice at the bottom of that, uh, that image there from the actual study, these were all estimates. There, I want you to take note that no data was available. These are all educated guesses, and, and later on I'll prove they're actually quite good educated guesses. The, uh, the ta big takeaways here is um, the total number of pesticide poisonings right across Canada per year was about 6,000 in their estimate, um, 18 per 100,000 residents. Um, with predominantly poisonings of children under six years old being the, the highest number there at about 45, uh, 42 to 45 percent in Ontario up to 50. So that was some pretty uh, new information for the industry to see some, uh, some interesting estimates made on made uh, without quantifiable data but nonetheless uh, were presented and, and that's what we're, we began reeling from. Now since that time um, now that was uh, in 2007. Th uh, in uh, 10 years ago, so this would have been 2010, three years later, um, there were no pesticide reporting standards. Uh, basically, if you wanted to find out how many poisonings occurred, you'd have to call the Poison Control Center in each province and add them all up. Now, so there was nothing really in place to track all these, as uh, there was a very wide range or a very vague um, opinion and list of products that were considered pesticides. Um, in 2014, jumping ahead 10 years or four years later, sorry, uh, we began to collect information and we learned that uh, very similar to that uh, Boyd study or Suzuki study was 38% were uh, exposure of kids zero to four, five to nine of kids uh, or five years to nine years old, another five percent uh, were human exposure calls, which really falls fairly close to uh, the Suzuki guesstimation. You know, we're into the low 40s, mid 40s in terms of uh, poisonings. And uh, even still, as you stay in between the 10 and 15 years, we're starting to get influence of those kids into the workforce. So that number begins to drop. But nonetheless, um, in 2014, those calls to the Poison Control Center were fairly consistent with the uh, assessment uh, by Suzuki. Now, what we did was we took the estimate, or what I did is I took the estimate in 2007 from, from Suzuki Foundation and compared it to the actuals. So although the uh, actual calls were a little bit off, the percentages were really quite close. Uh, each were collected from the poison control centers here in Alberta. Now, what was um, not stated before, but was stated since the the, we started tracking it, is uh, what falls under the... Uh, umbrella of a pesticide. Um, now, typically, when you when you ask the average person on the on the road what they think a pesticide is, uh, immediately they think um, turf insecticide as a general rule. But if we look really closely at um, how those pesticide poisonings are being recorded or were being recorded, rather, uh, you can see the usage categories that these fall into. And I hope it brings a little bit of attention to the fact that um, out of in each of these categories, you can see insecticides, um, they include mothballs, flea shampoos, uh, you know, uh, pet collars, garden sprays, roach baits, insect repellents, and bug sprays. Similarly for herbicides and fungicides, rotendicides, they're not all commercial products. In fact, the vast majority are domestically used products. Now, the Poison Control Service in 2017 recorded uh, 27,000 um, calls. Uh, just about 28,000 
three of which are 854 were specific to pesticides. And now this is when we started uh, tracking all the data. Now, again, same sort of thing. This is about 10 years after um, the uh, pesticide ban or the pesticide ban um, went through through 2009. Um, we still were at the same, this 2017, 10 years later, still exactly the same um, percentage of poisons of children under five. Uh, very, very close, within 1%, we could call it uh, nondescript or, or not significantly different year over year. So here we are after the, uh, you know, several years after the pesticide ban with really no change. To look at it uh, in its entirety, balancing, uh, you know, seven years of, of data from once we start, first started taking uh, all this stuff, uh, insect, insecticides drop a little bit, but it's also interesting to note, I've looked at all the years in between and they tend to fluctuate quite a bit with changing seasons, you know, based on degree days and whatnot. Um, in fact, herbicides have increased um, consistently over uh, from 2014, despite our increased restrictions in uh, herbicide use for municipalities. Uh, also, interestingly enough, we have an increase in miscellaneous and unknown, unknown um, pesticides being used, which could be a corollary to uh, uh, dropping availability. So the, the real takeaways here, uh, now the herbicide uh, uh, data here is for 2020, right up to August 31st, very recent, um, but it shows almost a double poisonings of herbicide in um, uh, from 2014 to 2020. From my perspective and our perspective, um, looking at these comparative numbers, uh, I think we have to all ask each other, is the pesticide ban really working if it was rolled out for that single purpose to, to uh, reduce the poisonings of children under five or six? So the category analysis shows herbicide poisonings have increased. Um, unknown poisonings increased from 13 to 13, almost 14%. And uh, what's unfortunate here is the highest percentage of poisonings occur with domestically available products. So I'll ask, you know, when we choose to make decisions, restrict the use of products based on uh, opinion and perspective, uh, at the time, we didn't have the data to make a calculated decision on these uh, restrictions. Uh, now here we are 10 years later, and we're seeing that our restrictions haven't made a hill of beans, haven't changed a thing. In fact, um, quite the contrary. So I hope we, uh, I wanted to make sure that everybody sees the, the, um, the challenge that we're facing right now. Now in 2014, we had a, we, the data proved that we had, uh, and I'm sorry, it's about, you know, seven years outdated now, but the uh, location of these exposure calls inter uh, illustrated an interesting um, percentages here. Now, obviously, if the majority of uh, pesticide poisonings are happening uh, with kids five and six, then it would make perfect sense that these poisonings were happening at home. If you look at work, 1.7% of poisonings. Let's, let's consider we're all using commercial products. Um, the likelihood of spill and exposure when using the concentrate is much higher when we're mixing. And I think that's where that 1.7 uh, very likely comes from. Um, schools, very low rates, farms, similar to work, which is essentially work. 88% um, happening at home. So I, I'll question um, the regulation of uh, municipalities to ban pesticide uses, pesticide use, um, why does that, why, why did it include a regulation of commercial application um, when seemingly the exposure is not happening at work, it's not happening out in the playground, um, it's not happening in the schoolyard, um, it's all happening at home. So provincial poisonings from 2007 to 2019, again, show very little um, jump year over year, despite all of our efforts to ban it and make it, make it safer around here. Now, to, I wanted to present you with one other side of this story, um, secondary impact. You know, I was uh, out visiting my folks in Vancouver, 
couple years ago and I watched the rain pouring down and I'm seeing on the right hand of your screen there all the um, the grub problem that they had that was uh, you know the crows and the skunks coming in to tear, tear up their uh, lawns to eat the grubs and uh, of course they're under a, a pesticide ban in uh, residential uses so um, anyways what I, I'm watching the rain fall down and I'm watching this bare earth wash off the lawn down the sidewalk into the storm drains and uh, realizing that um, what we've done by banning uh, insecticides in, in that region, uh, for example, is uh, washing soil directly into our waterways. Uh, and it's our fault. Um, when we talk about eutrophication and nutrient loading, um, phosphorus being a big culprit there, uh, phosphorus is immobile in the soil. Once it's applied to the soil, it doesn't move unless you move the soil. So maybe, just maybe, all of our efforts to um, minimize risk to our children, and uh, although well-intended, uh, without the data has proven to cause more damage than good. And this has all come from this precautionary uh, principle. Um, in theory, it's not a bad thing to be precautious. But now that we've um, had enough years uh, have passed that we can look at the data and really see the numbers. I think it's time we relook at this whole pesticide ban from a municipal level and realize that um, we're not going to um, we're not going to affect uh, the safety of children by banning uh, pesticides at this point. Uh, we know now that uh, what we've done so far isn't working. So ultimately, to uh, to summarize here, uh, the data is telling us that. Uh, predominantly poisonings our children and it remains relatively unchanged despite the pesticide ban 10 years ago. So moving forward what we have been able to uh, conclude is that the poison and drug uh, information system data illustrates that herbicide restrictions haven't really uh, achieved the objective as it was thought out uh, so long ago the data proves all that. Protecting children under six years uh, really needs to begin at home with 88% of all the poisonings happening there and not at the workplace. So rather than restricting uh, pesticides uh, at work or out in the field or in the workplace, um, we're not really doing uh, what we set out to do. Um, herbicides can improve the quality of our fields without risking public safety and uh, certainly without the uh, extra cost that we've incurred trying to stay ahead of these weeds without using the tools that are approved and uh, have been tested by Health Canada as being safe. So uh, as the educated, uh, you need to educate your decision makers in the municipality about the true um, uh, or the perceived dangers of pesticide and uh, follow up your discussions with some real accurate data. So moving por forward, I think uh, parents need to bear responsibility for protecting uh, our children from exposure to pesticides. It's not happening at the workplace. Um, as I mentioned before, science, not opinion, needs to be driving uh, legislative decisions and, uh, and objectives. So as trained professionals yourselves, we need to inform the public of the true risks of uh, pesticide use. Um, that uh, concludes my presentation. Thank you all for uh, spending uh, this hour with me, and I wish you the best of luck. Enjoy the rest of the virtual conference. Thank you.